This morning we began a lesson on the concept of doing good, being a good person and doing good as a Christian does good, showing their faith, helping those who are around them, demonstrating that they actually have a genuine faith. And we looked at some passages where the Apostle Peter made it abundantly clear that in our sojourning, our pilgrimage here on earth as Christians, that we are to be doers of good. And we looked at several passages that made that very clear that even though we do not earn our salvation, we cannot merit it, we cannot buy our way into heaven, we understand that. But part of saving faith is works, good works, doing the things that God wants us to do. That's a part of having genuine, saving, justifying faith in the sight of God. And tonight I want to continue that theme as we look at Luke chapter 10, as we make some practical applications of doing good and examples of doing good. We need to ask ourselves, are we a good doer? A doer of that which is good, producing works not to glorify ourself, not to honor ourself, not for someone else to pat us on the back but to genuinely honor God and to help those who are around us. You know, Jesus made it very clear in the Sermon on the Mount that we're not supposed to do our deeds of love to be seen of men. Those who try to tell you the good things that they do and they almost brag about the good things that they do, they need to learn a lesson from the Sermon on the Mount. Stop trying to brag. Stop trying to do these things, putting them on display as if it's some sort of badge or trophy that they can uh, have to display to people and, and uh, get accolades from men. Jesus condemned that attitude. We should do good because it's the will of God if everybody sees it or nobody sees it. God sees it. And remember, we studied this morning how that our good works glorify God. You see, in Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 9, he says, "...not of works, lest any man should boast." We cannot merit or earn salvation, but in the very next verse, Ephesians 2 and verse 10, he says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto or for good works, that we should walk in them. Therefore, we have a responsibility to walk in good works. These works are a part of our saving faith. Luke chapter 10, we have an example of someone who did good. You often heard or hear in the news when someone goes out and helps people, they're called a good Samaritan. A good Samaritan. That's part of our language, part of our phraseology in the United States. When we have someone that does something randomly good, they're called a good Samaritan. Recently, when we had all the ice on the road, there was a man going around in his pickup, pulling people out of the ditch and helping them out. And he was referred to on the news as a good Samaritan. They spotted him from the helicopter. And so there is a good Samaritan helping people who are in need. Not wanting accolades, not wanting to have people look at him. He's just doing that which is good. Well, it comes from Luke chapter 10, the parable of the good Samaritan. Look at verse 25 of Luke chapter 10. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, testing Jesus, saying, Teacher, What shall I do to inherit eternal life? What can I do to have eternal life? What can I do to go to heaven? He said to him, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? In verse 27, the lawyer said, he answered him and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. That's from Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5. And Leviticus 19 and verse 18. And he said to him, Jesus saying to him, You have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. Now notice this. To live spiritually, you got to do something. you got to do God's will. Those who say it's just faith only. It's faith alone. You don't do anything. Christ done it all. Look at what Jesus said. You do this, you will live. He was talking to someone who was already biologically alive. He's talking about eternal life. You do this 
and you will live. This is God's will. You'll have everlasting life. Verse 29, he answered, said, he answered the lawyer did, and wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, Who is my neighbor? You see, the Jewish concept of a neighbor was your fellow Jew. That's like some people today, who their concept of their neighbor is someone that has the same skin color they do. Whether it's white or black or Hispanic, that's their neighbor. Everyone else is outside the circle. They have a prejudiced attitude. And that's an ungodly attitude, as we see from various passages in the Bible. And this Jewish individual, well, who, who is my neighbor? Verse 30. Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. This was a very common occurrence in the first century. Very treacherous roads. People would travel down. And here this person fell upon hard times. Verse 31. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. The priest considered the apex, the very pinnacle of spirituality. Saw him and passed by on the other side. It's not that he didn't see him. He saw him. He didn't do anything to him. Didn't do anything to help him. Verse 32, likewise a Levite. When he arrived at the same place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. Saw him, but passed by on the other side. Verse 33, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. Now, you have to understand that even though we use the phrase Good Samaritan in a positive way in our society, a Samaritan was looked down upon 2,000 years ago. In fact, at one point, the Jewish uh, leadership got angry at Jesus and said, you are a Samaritan. They, they didn't mean that as a compliment. They were insulting Jesus. They were throwing insult. You're a Samaritan. And so the Samaritan in this parable, being the hero was something that was unheard of in the minds of the Jewish individual. A certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, he came where he was, he saw the man in need, and he had compassion. And it didn't stop there. So he went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him, showing hospitality to this individual. And notice he didn't have to bring him into his house physically to show hospitality. Nothing wrong with doing that. This is a complete stranger. But he did lodge this stranger. He didn't have to bring him into his own house to uh, take care of him. He brought him into an inn and took care of him there. Verse 35, on the next day. When he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. You take care of him while I'm gone. Whatever you spend on taking care of him, I'll repay you. See, he's still taking care of him, even though he's in the care of someone else. So he is doing good. Verse 36, Which of these three, Jesus asked, do you think was neighbor to him who fell among thieves? And the lawyer answered, he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The important thing to learn here is not who is my neighbor, but are you a neighbor? That's the point. Are you doing good? Who was neighbor to him who fell among thieves? And you notice the lawyer could not even bring himself to say the Samaritan. So despised they were. Such a strong prejudice there was. So he couldn't even say the Samaritan. He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said, you go be like the Samaritan. You go and you do likewise. So we see here that Jesus in this parable of the Good Samaritan is giving us an example of doing good. There's an opportunity to do good and this person avails himself of this opportunity whereas the Levite and the priest who were supposed to be the spiritual leaders of God's people did not take the time to do what they should have done. They were not fulfilling the law of Moses that was given to them that they claimed that they were the experts in and that they taught to everyone else. 
Yet this Samaritan, the despised people of that day, did show compassion. Examples of doing good. Let's talk about that just for a moment. <clears throat> and we have, all throughout the scriptures, we have people that we are told that we are to look out for and to help. We are to have pure and undefiled religion in which we help those who are widows and those who are orphans. James chapter 1. <clears throat> James chapter 1 and verse 27. The Holy Spirit through James says this, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit the orphan and the widows in their affliction or their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. So we're to keep ourselves pure, keep ourselves holy, unspotted from the world, live the life God has told us to live, and a part of that undefiled religion is to uh, take care of, visit. That word visit means to see the needs of and to take care of it. Those who are orphans, those who are widows. Some Christians are able to do that by adoption. Some might be able to sponsor someone that's in an orphan home and help out in that way. Help out those who are widows. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later on as we talk about those who are uh, considered widows that are, be, are to be taken into the number within a congregation that are to be assisted financially. And so we see here that caring for widows and orphans is something that God wants us to do. Both Old and New Testament tell us that. Psalm 68 and verse 5, God is a God for the widow and for the orphan. And so if we're going to be uh, the true followers of God, we are going to take care of those who are in need. We have two uh, role models in this. We have a person by the name of Job of the Old Testament, Job chapter 29 Verses 12 through 13, Job, in pleading his case before his critical friends who were asking him, what have you done to, to, to have God punish you like this? He says, I've taken care of the widow. I've taken care of the orphan. I have cared for their needs. So uh, Job is making the case that I have been there to help those who are in need. Then in the New Testament, we have the example of a lady by the name of Tabitha, also known as Dorcas, Acts chapter 9. Verses 36 through 39. You remember, she died. They were having a funeral there. Peter went to the funeral and they were displaying all the things that she had done. All the good that she had done. And Peter, as oftentimes Jesus would, he interrupted the funeral by resurrecting the dead. That was just how they operated in the first century with those miraculous powers. Every time you see Jesus or an apostle at a funeral, they interrupt it. By raising the dead. And so we see that in the time of that miraculous power, this was done. But they were displaying, this is the good person she was. She did good. She helped people. We are to be practicing pure and undefiled religion before God, both as a, uh, as a congregation collectively and individually. We have an opportunity to help the boys home. Fill that pantry full of the items that are requested. And help those who are in need is one way that we can engage in that. Supporting the weak. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 35. Paul says this is what God wants us to do. To help those who are weak. Acts <clears throat> chapter 20. And verse 35. Paul says I have shown you in every way by laboring like this. That you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he says, It is more blessed to give than to receive. So we see here the, the words of the Lord Jesus, It's more blessed to give than to receive. And that's helping those who are weak. We are to help those with burdens. Those with difficulties in their life. Galatians chapter 6. Especially those who have spiritual problems. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Galatians 6, verse 1 and 2. Brethren, if any man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So helping those who are weak is part of our doing good. 
There are those who are spiritually weak. They have become that way because they have allowed the things of the world to choke out the Word of God. They've fallen away. We need to be there to help them in whatever way possible. There are those who are spiritually, spiritually weak because they're new Christians. They're babies in Christ, as it were. They have freshly been converted to Christ, and therefore the devil's working overtime to pull them away. And we need to be there for those who are, are weak in that sense and to help them to grow stronger in whatever way we can. So supporting the weak is the way that we fulfill the law of Jesus Christ. Also, visiting the sick. The importance of visiting the sick is something that we should be involved in. Again, it's the concept of visiting with the purpose of seeing, is there something I can do to help? Jesus was very involved in helping those who were sick. Luke chapter 4 and verse 40. Luke chapter 9 and verse 2. Luke chapter 10 and verse 9. Of course, he was tending to them by healing them, displaying his miraculous power. But we are to pray for those who are sick in James chapter 5, verses 14 through 15. The elders, they are to go to those who are sick and pray for them. Whether it's spiritual sickness, whether it's physical sickness, uh, spiritual sickness or physical sickness, or it could be both. Going to those individuals and trying to see if there's something that can be done to help them and praying for them. Caring for those who are sick. They may be injured, they may be hurt, and we need to be there to help them. That's part of our doing good. Entertaining or helping strangers. Is this not what we saw in the Good Samaritan? The Good Samaritan didn't know this person. But he took the time, he stepped outside of his comfort zone to help this individual. Help this individual. Showing hospitality literally means in the Greek to be a love, have a love for strangers. You know, Peter told us to honor all people. We are to help all people. We are to do good unto all people, as we will see a little bit later on. And so we are to assist those who are strangers because uh, the Hebrew writer tells us in Hebrews 13 and verse 2, some have entertained angels unawares. And that's referring, of course, to Abraham and the angelic vi uh, visitation that he had. We're to help those who are strangers. And this is something that is required for a man to be an elder. He is to be given to hospitality. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2. One of those qualifications is, do they help those who are in need? Not just their friends. You know it's easy to help your friends. It's he easy to help people you like. What about helping a complete stranger? Showing agape love. You don't have any physical or, or excuse me, a, 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 an emotional connection with that person. But you love them based upon the will of God. You love your neighbor as yourself. So you're able to help that individual. And so that's one of the requirements of being an elder. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2. And also... For the widow who is to be taken into the number of the widows within a congregation that are to be financially supported, they have to have a reputation of helping and doing good. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. If they assisted people, if they lodged strangers, and please understand, just as the Samaritan, he did not take this stranger into his house to lodge him. He still lodged him. Nothing wrong with taking a stranger into your house. It can be dangerous in our society. We need to be very careful in helping people that we totally do not know. But this congregation lodges strangers all the time. We put them up in the motel there. We pay for their room. That's lodging strangers, helping those who are in need. So you don't have to have them in your physical house to help those who are in need. So... Helping those who come to us for help. Also, this was true in the first century, and some places in the world is true today, remembering and assisting those who are in prison. And what I mean by that is though are, are those who are in prison for the cause of Christ. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 3, Hebrews 10 and verse 34. Uh, Paul was... Uh, he visited, well, had visitation while he was in prison. Acts chapter uh, 24 and verse 23. 
He commends uh, the brethren in Philippians 4 and verse 14 and in verse 18 for assisting him and helping him while he was in prison. We have brethren throughout the world. If you read that magazine right back there, it talks about the mission work that's going on around the world. We have brethren in prison for the cause of Christ. In those places where Christianity is outlawed. In those places where the only means of getting the truth might be through the internet. That might be through someone smuggling Bibles in over the border. There are some amazing stories you ought to read in that magazine of our modern day brethren and how that they have to face persecution. And we need to be remembering those brethren who have those persecutions and are in prison for the cause of Christ. Willing to share. We understand that we are stewards stewards of everything that we have. We have to have this ability to share and to help those who are in need. Or who are in need. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Oftentimes when we read this verse, we, we think when we see the word rich, we think of Donald Trump. We think of multimillionaires. But we have to understand that we as, as American citizens are rich compared to most of the world. We are a wealthy people, very, very blessed. And we have a responsibility to help those. And so when he says, command those who are rich, we need to apply that to ourselves, not just to the Donald Trumps of the world. We are wealthy. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. You can't take it with you anyway, so share it. Help those who are in need. And we know that in sharing, that is a sacrifice that is well-pleasing to God. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 16. We understand the greatest example, of course, of sharing, of helping, of doing good is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He did nothing but good. As Peter was preaching in Acts chapter 10, as Peter preached to the Gentiles, he said, Christ went about doing good. He's the only person who perfectly ever did nothing but good. Because he never sinned. He never violated the will of God. And in Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. It says. In verse 9. Let us not grow weary. While doing good. For in due season we shall reap. If we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially those who are of the household of faith. You see here, as Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, we can grow weary in well-doing because we, we have so much around us that's negative as far as the world is concerned, but we have to keep our, our proper perspective. We have to keep our mind in the Word of God. To realize that what we are doing is truly the will of God and that it really will benefit us not only in this life but in the life to come. In due season we will reap if we don't lose heart, if we don't give up. Therefore, when we have these opportunities, and we need to look for these opportunities, let us do good to all. Helping those who are weak. Sharing the gospel with them. When they come to us, when they have a need, physical need, let us help them. Supporting those who are sick. Being willing to share the wealth that we have been so richly blessed with. We will have opportunities to do this. Let's take those opportunities to do good, especially to those who are of the church. The household of faith. We're to love the brotherhood. 
We are to have a top priority in helping out our brothers and sisters in Christ. Doing good. Are we doing good? Are we doing good as individual Christians? Are we doing good as a collective of the Lord's church? Are we doing good each and every day of our life? Seeing those opportunities, praying for those opportunities to be there, to help those who are in need. Spread the gospel, being that good example to people around us so that they might glorify our Father in heaven. If you need to become a Christian, that's, that's where the good starts. In obeying the gospel and being forgiven of your sins. Believe in Jesus with all your heart. Make the great confession that He is the Son of God. Repent of all your sins and be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. And the Lord will add you to the household of faith, which is the church. If you've done that, you've gone astray. You're not doing good anymore. We urge you to repent and start doing good. As always, the choice is yours while we stand and while we sing.